Yeah, people come in. So uh, let me again reiterate this scheme and then particularly uh, discuss a uh, few uh, more technical aspects of it. And then we continue with it. So again, we do measurements. By these measurements, what we obtain, uh, we uh, present as a mean value according to some unknown distribution. Then we obtain this distribution, uh, assuming that it must uh, agree with all measurements and accept nothing else uh, into this uh, distribution, which means maximizing entropy. After that, we introduce the same number of parameters as how we make measurements. So our distribution rho depends on the same number of parameters. But those parameters need to be expressed. The parameters are lambdas, and they are just linearly uh, related to the logarithm of our distribution. Uh, after that, we need to express them through the measured value. Okay? So that's more or less the scheme, which I remind you. Now, the question is, uh, are these equations are always compatible? This is a set of n equations. And as I said, this is a solution if I can satisfy these equations. Okay? And uh, the bad news here is that they aren't always compatible, which means that your data, again, this is a pretty arbitrary set of measurement. That, in a sense, when uh, data people or experimentalists, uh, they find out that they don't have insufficient data or there's bad data or something, when they try to solve this equation and they aren't compatible. And I give you the simplest example of such incompatibility is if you just uh, consider r i's are x i's rho of x dx. Just the moments of it, right? So i equal to 0 tells you that r0 is 1, right? It's just a normalization. i1 gives you the first moment, like we did with Ising model. i2 gives you the second moment. But i3 gives you the third moment. So imagine that your i is 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. So you have some R3, which means that your distribution rho must be exponent two, 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 lambda 3 x cube. What's wrong with that distribution? For those who are late, I, I give an example when such a system of equation, which we need to satisfy so that this distribution satisfies this measurement. So this is an example where this is an incompatible. When lambda 3 is non-zero, uh, and I know that my x is minus infinity infinity, then this is a non-normalizable distribution. No matter, I cannot find non-zero lambda 3 for which this is normalizable, OK? And it's a very interesting and beautiful science. But it's, of course, there could be distributions which have a third moment non-zero. They're just skewed distribution, right? So your measurement are like this. Sorry, guys, out of this measurement, you cannot determine the distribution which realizes maximum of entropy. And then you try to play, which means that it doesn't mean that you cannot build a distribution. You can build distribution, but you can always find another distribution which have a little bit higher entropy just by tweaking parameters. And there are beautiful mathematical theorems. I'll give an example in the lecture. I just don't want to go much into this. But this is to show you that this is a non-trivial business we are talking about. And it's usually when, uh, particularly if you are theoreticians like me, if what you're doing, you're consulting practical people or you are working with experimentalists. And so when experimentalists bring you data, then you tell them, guys, there is something 
or wrong with your data, or maybe you need more data. Because if we would have lambda 4, it would be OK. We can find lambda 4 that would give us a normalizable thing together with the lambda 3, right? That we can afford. This is one thing that I want to discuss. And second thing what I really want to ask you, how we know that this is, this is extremum, right? So we, we differentiated this with respect to rho, get this equation, right? This equal to this. But how we know that it's a maximum and not minimum? And, uh, and the answer, again, is a pretty simple and beautiful trick which shows you how actually relative entropy is important. Let us prove that if such equation could be satisfied, this distribution realizes entropy maximum and not minimum. Okay? As usual, as you probably notice, uh, every time we prove that this is a maximum and not minimum, is either we prove second derivative, which means the second variation, which is a it's also doable, but it's kind of ugly business. Always say that let's just find some other distribution g. Is it visible? Probably not. So we take some other distribution g, and this distribution must satisfy the same conditions, right? So we say that g of x uh, r j of x are equal to the same Ri's, Rj's, right? So we say that if there is exist any other distribution, we satisfy this equation, right? But uh, I can also then say that if I take g logarithm rho, do you remember what is logarithm rho? It is this one. It's a, a lambda i r i, which is the same as a rho logarithm rho uh, dx, dx, right? And that suggests that now we can, because we know this one, which is this one, right? So we can now make d g rho, which would be dx g log g over rho, right? Which is uh, minus s of g plus s of rho. Because g log rho is the same as rho log rho, and this is minus s of rho. But any relative entropy is non-negative. Okay? And this is the definition, and this is the proof that what we found is uh, the maximum. It's the simplest proof that I found. There are many, many proofs around, but at least this is a, a relatively straightforward. Okay? Now we continue with measurements. And so what we say is that <coughs> any measurements, yes? Will this not also work if we swap the position of rho and g? Then suppose we swap the position of rho and g in the last line. We, we will get the entropy of g greater than entropy. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, if you do this, then there will be quantity which you don't know because what stands here is rho log rho over g, which is minus s of rho, but you don't know what is rho log g. You know what is g log rho. You see? That's why we need to take it from, the, from g to rho. It's somehow kind of strange because it's now relative entropy, assuming that this is a true distribution. But it does not matter. It's, you know, it's a, it's a weapon. You can use it uh, uh, in both directions. Okay? Now, I want to continue with this measurement and how much it lowers the entropy. So what we discuss, that any measurement 
lowers the entropy. And if it's done under a finite temperature, then it needs, uh, it lowers uh, entropy and increases free energy. And if it increases free energy, it gives some extra work, which means that the first uh, law tells us that whatever uh, measurement we do, we need to do work of measurement, which is at least uh, uh, that uh, change of uh, entropy that we brought. Uh, let me look how I, uh, what I, my notations uh, will be. Uh, yep. So measurements would be. Uh, uh, but generally, I may say that because I did measurements, I mean, this M measuring device, demon or whatever, uh, it also changed its state. This is also part of a physical world, right? So in principle, I don't know what it is, but I can say that this is something which is uh, uh, the change of state. It could be ideal, demonic, just does not change. I mean, nothing in physical variables in this world changes, but it could be a change. So let's consider this a little bit more general so that we have this change. Or in other ways, I would say that this is T. What is this change of? It's an entropy which was before. This is my system, A. This is my measuring device, M. And afterwards is the entropy of them together. So I brought measuring device plus delta Fm. And it, uh, M. And it looks pretty complicated at this point and because there were many paradoxes, decades of paradoxes, where people were actually kind of disregarding this part and, say, and trying to prove. But this is the most general form. It tells you that uh, you really must to do work which corresponds to a change of free energy of the whole system, right? So the whole system is your system and measuring device, right? So initially, it is what was your uh, contribution to entropy. And you brought them into contact. So you change now. The entropy is now the entropy of your system and measuring device. And the state of measuring device also changed. Okay. Now, you can say, OK, good. But this statement that I, you need to do this number amount of work, well, it's actually inequality because it's, again, from below. You can do it in a non-quasi-static non way, et cetera. It only would satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. But look what we did with the help of this demon. We just turn thermal energy, we're just using that this wall, they have finite temperature. So our particle inside has finite temperature, right? It heats, it loses its energy, but then it returns to the wall, it gets its temperature back, right? So it's really, we turn thermal energy into work. Yes? Uh, I have a question about this statement. Why, how do you make sure that before and after the measurement, the temperature doesn't change? I mean, before the measurement, you don't even know the temperature. I assume it. All this is done assuming that we are in the environment which keeps the temperature. The moment we go and, and work with, you know, cold atom in an optical lattice, this would be a, a very interesting question, how really the temperature changes after you do manipulation. All this is Maxwell setting. Namely, environment sets the temperature. It's fixed. Now I do some manipulations. Okay? But what I really now want to call your attention, and that would cause few decades of very intense and very idiotic debate, is that uh, Maxwell actually argument, namely that any information delta S has an energetic value, you need to do work to get this measurement. It's all about first law of thermodynamics. Uh, first law of thermodynamics. It's all about energy conservation, right? You cannot get uh, something which allows you to do work without spending that much of work. 
But what about second law? Why now, after the, I did this work, I again do my measurement, find out where my particle is, put again this, and then do more work, and then do more work, and then do more work. So what I would get, I would get my perpetuum mobile of a second kind, which respects energy conservation, but which produces motion up of, this is just work, right? So this would move, 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 and move using thermal energy of, of my thermostat. That's what people started to ask 100 years after Maxwell, and were pretty confused. Uh, what would your answer to it will be? So I'm doing cycle after cycle after cycle. Every time I'm measuring position of it, okay, I'm measuring, I'm spending work on it, right? But then I'm getting this after uh, out of, uh, of, of thermostat, I get this work back. So what is missing here in this simple argument? And what Landauer, Rolf Landauer, great a physicist, introduced uh, back here. M must be easier for you because you are 21st century people and you, uh, for you, what is memory, computer memory, is not something which is an abstract thing for people in 20th century. Well, I grew up, nobody cared about, you know, you, you cared about your grandma memory, but not about computer memories that it's getting filled. But you know, <laughs> get the, so what you really need to make this real cycle? You know, to have a cycle, you need at the end of a cycle, return to the same state in which you were at the beginning of the cycle. But when I was kind of saying this, that then let's measure again, let's measure again, let's measure again. I mean, this demon, I did not return it back to its state, right? Which means that it still had this, uh, somewhere written his first bit of information, the second bit of information. So I am actually doing this, filling its uh, memory by bits of information. Then there is no contradiction here. Okay, I turn Telma energy into work, but I essentially I am collecting more and more and more information about the system. So if you really want to do the whole cycle, you need at the end of a cycle erase this information, and then start anew, okay? But then what it means to erase the information? So this was measurement. Now let's write erasure. How you can actually erase? So let's say you know which part of a, a box your molecule is, right? Now you want to do something which means physical to the system and erases information, makes it irrelevant. There are many ways to do it, but particular way, and that precisely what, and again, I'll, I'm talking now about pretty recent experiment, just maybe four or five years ago. Uh, one way to do it is to compress your phase space. So you can say, okay, no matter what, where if, if I know this, I just put my piston here, I pushed it all the way here, and then I know that it's here, no matter. If it was here, it is here. If it was here, it is also here. Which means that I put my system in a state, namely I did this and then I did that, right? In which no matter what, information is erased. So now, I mean, after this I know that it's here. In the experiment, which I'm about to maybe tell a little bit later, that what people actually do, they have this, nanoparticle, which uh, and you create optical, by optical tweezer, you create a potential well, right? So it's a u as a function of x, right? It's very big. It's nature and PRL. Nature was like, I don't know, seven years ago, and PRL was like five years ago. It's, it's relatively recent work. So your particle is initially here, and you want to erase this information. So what they do, they do, uh, as they like to say, protocol. So again, the, these are 
it's actually a set of two, if I remember right, two lasers or maybe three. So this kind of creates some configuration of field. By changing it a little bit, you can kind of manipulate this. So you can take it into something like this. And then on the third step, you can tilt it. Namely, you just impose electric field. An electric field just tilts your potential, right? So you get it like this. And then eventually your particle, like, like in this case, you make sure that it is on the left no matter. If it was here, it is here. If it was here, it is also here after this procedure. But this is a trivial part. Now what they do, then they measured work, which is a force at the position of a particle times velocity of the particle integrated over time. Okay. Now, first let's see what Landauer predicts, and then we'll see what they were measuring. So now, if I really do erasure, <coughs> what I need to do with this uh, thing, this is means that whatever entropy of my measuring device I need to wipe. And I need to return it to the same uh, state. I mean, because if there were any change of its free energy, I don't know. For example, you cool, you heat your demon, or you compressed it, or you expanded it. So you need to return it back. Okay. And then what Landauer has shown us, surprisingly, that a total price of a cycle namely how much work you need to do to do this cycle would be W measurements plus W erasure, which is T times S of A uh, uh, minus, yeah, minus. Yeah, yeah, plus. plus S of M minus S of A M. And delta F cancels out because, you know, if you change it here, you need to return it here. What is it? S of A plus S of M minus S of A M. It's a mutual information. And that was more, it's 1961. It's pretty long uh, ago. It still it took some time before physicists started to realize that we really need mutual information. It's an important quantity. Look, it's totally universal. It tells you if you do everything quasi-statically, it does not matter how you change this or how you change this. The total energetic price of a cycle just determined by the degree of correlation between your system and measuring device. That's mutual information, okay? That's it. Procedure is an important, okay? And in this particular case, because what you do, you actually uh, compress your phase space twice, then you say that this must be T uh, logarithm two must be your work. But of course, and this is called Landauer limit. So essentially, this statement that this price of a cycle must be is, of course, quasi-static limit. Right? And it's very important, because in thermodynamics, classically, when we consider changes which were not including information, we were saying that the work could be done arbitrarily low as long as we do it arbitrarily slow. What this formula tells you, forget it. The moment that information is involved, namely that you're changing degree of, you're exploiting degree of correlation, this is a mutual information. Even arbitrarily slow, you cannot make your work less than this. It, our computers aren't still there. It's, they're still working at a finite rate. It's about 100, maybe 1,000, but already some, some really 100 times larger than so-called Landauer limit. But 
every time you do on computer end, oxent, or, or oxor, it is logically a reversible operation. You are raising a bit. You need to generate t log 2 heat. And that's what these people were doing this beautiful experiment. They really checked and they found the following measurement. So they were measuring this w divided by t as a function of tau, which is the whole time of this cycle. And what they found out, a set of points, and this was logarithm 2. So this is, in a sense, the first direct demonstration that really whatever you do any logical procedure of erasing a bit, you spend t log 2 on it, OK? And it also demonstrates you how you actually put information and heat on the same basis. So you really have formulas now in which your information comes together with, with whatever else. And in particularly, one can look at this Maxwell device in a little bit more general way. So again, let's take something from the very first lecture. So we have two systems, one and two, you remember? And we brought them into contact on the very first lecture, OK? And we say that this is the only thing that we know is that E1 plus E2 is equal to E and it's constant, which is essentially a statement that DE1 equal to minus DE2, right? So they were exchanging this energy. And then what we were saying is that one, that if we take DE1 over T1, this is a change of entropy of the first system, right? If you take DE2 over T2, it's change of entropy of the second system, right? And one of them is positive, another is negative. We were trying to understand which way heat flows, you remember? We're trying to make sense of our definition of uh, entropy. And we say that this is larger or equal than 0. But because this is this, so we would get that 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2 DE1 larger or equal than 0, right? which told you that if t1 is larger than t2, then this is smaller, then this is negative, and this must be negative. So t1 loses energy. If t1 is smaller, then this is larger, then d1 is positive, then e1 gets energy. What now we can add to it in the spirit of Maxwell is that Let's imagine that when we brought this two system in a, to a thermal contact, there were not only uh, heat ex energy exchange, but there were also some kind of a change in mutual information. So there were set certain correlations in the system which either appeared out of it or were used and destroyed. So there were some correlations before, and after that, there were less correlations. Okay? So now, if we say that there were no correlations before, then afterwards, this correlation appear. This, and this is together is non-negative. So if there were no initial correlation before we brought system into contact, but then some correlation appeared, well, because you see them kind of, you know, this started to feel this somewhere. Then our criterion is the same, but even now this change is bounded from below. But it's the same. DE1 has the same sign as this difference. Namely, it flows from hot to cold. 
But imagine that we have our demon, so that before we brought them into contact, we had some information, we had some correlations between these two systems, namely, we created it such so that there were more hot molecules over here and cold molecules over here, some kind of a, a correlation. This is a treated generic, no matter what. Then this would be negative, right? This would be negative, which means that our correlation existed and then disappeared. We used them after it. Then we can have, then this would be uh, positive, and this we could afford to be negative. So we can transfer heat from cold to hot if we destroy some correlations in the process. You see? And this is again, and this is how we actually widen our thermodynamics by introducing informational uh, entropic aspects to it on equal footing with, with energetic aspects. Question. Yeah, in a sense, it tells you that if you do a measurement, it's very non-trivial because you may change a state of a measuring device. And that it was a lot of paradoxes. If you really try to read the kind of uh, a little bit all the literature, that you will see that people were kind of saying, okay, what the, what the hell they say? I can make it negative and whatever. But this is because this by itself no certain limit. Limit is on the sum. So it's really what Landauer understood is that the true limit, which is universal and does not depend on procedure, it's the sum of a cycle, which means measurement plus eraser. So if you want to return the state into the original. Exactly. You say that I want to do a cycle which consists of measurement, working, and erasing. Then it tells you that the sum of this work it really has no universal limit. Generally, you can say, okay, if I am sure that I don't change my device, it's demon. Demon is an ideal. Yeah, I cannot change his, his state. Then you can say that your work of measurement must be T log 2. The same you can say, like in this experiment, the work of erasure, the heat release. This is actually heat release of erasure, right? Must be T log 2. But generally, it's much more complicated. And the beauty of this formula is that it's really this complication disappears out of the sum. Okay? So that was a, a, an understanding of Landauer. More questions? Uh, okay. Now we start the next uh, uh, subject. And this is uh, something which we will continue. It's about uh, not measuring, not learning. It's about forgetting. Right? We already talked a little bit that you can uh, forget something. Again, you can use some information, forget it, and get something useful out of it. But of course, uh, physicists devised a very sophisticated way of forgetting things, which is renormalization group. Right? So there is a way uh, that we can really learn a lot by forgetting. So renormalization group is a way of learning by forgetting. So you try to wipe some details. You try to forget some things. And then you look what is actually appears out of it. So uh, you, all of you had uh, some kind of statistical physics with renormalization group, or somebody never seen block spin renormalization or anything else? You haven't seen block spin renormalization. Good. OK, so I'll give it uh, probably already the next question, a short version out of it. But uh, then you can always uh, look in the notes. But I'll start from a more uh, simple uh, and mathematical uh, and also universal way. So first of all, what? This renormalization group uh, teaches us is uh, to look not at a distribution. 
it's always, I mean, every time we learn something, I, I, I'm really trying to give you this researcher's perspective. So what is actually is important here? What, what kind of a new thing? The randomization group is, is a new way of looking into the statistic, saying it does not matter is with which distribution you are working now. This or that distribution is not that important. What is actually important is a flow in a space of distributions. So you have many, many different distributions. And then you start learning things, you change distribution. We already have seen how learning new thing, we, where is my exponent, minus lambda i r i. Every new r brings you, change your distribution. Every time you wipe one of it, you change your distribution, right? And so you now may look into a repeating procedure of this thing. And it could be a repeating procedure of learning, but it must be something which has a trivial elementary step. Because we are now going to look at an infinite number of such steps, right? And so the idea is let's do some elementary step which would consist in reducing information, in forgetting something, OK? And uh, let's see where it will bring us. Because not this or that distribution is important, but the flow in the space of distribution and the fixed point where it eventually come if such a fixed point exists, namely this limiting distribution. Because this limiting distribution will be then invariant under such a procedure. You cannot forget it more. It's already forgot everything and just keeps what is there, OK? So you've seen this procedure in, in this and that way. I just uh, give you kind of a little bit of mathematical uh, angle to it. And as most of the things which uh, uh, appear in mathematics here and which makes it so powerful, technically it's based on the same simple trick of adding random numbers. Just adding random numbers. So imagine that we uh, have a set of x1, xn. They are what is called identical, uh, 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 independent, identically distributed random numbers. So each one of them is kind of random. And we have an ensemble where we can just pick them up. And what we're going to do, we're going to uh, decrease the number of such variables, all right? So at every step, we just say that let's take zi and make it xi minus 1 plus xi. And uh, uh, now if I just add, then I would be, for example, increasing variance. Because they are independent. And I also assume that they are the mean value is 0. So just say just fluctuate around 0. So uh, I may uh, want, for example, to keep the mean value, which is 0. Or I may try to want to keep the variance. Because the variance sum, they are independent, right? So if I consider z squared mean value, it would be xi uh, squared plus xi minus 1 squared, because they are identical. This is just 2x squared, uh, <laughs> because the cross term is 0. So to keep uh, the same variance, I divide it by square root of 2. Okay, That's my transformation, which means that at the first step, I have n variables. The second step, I have n over 2 variables, n over 4, etc. But n is very, very large, so I can do it many, many times. And then my ask, what is the row of z, right? So it's easy. I just need to write a convolution. I need to say that I need to integrate over all x over all y so that x plus y <coughs> minus z square root of 2 rho of x rho of y, right? Uh, this is my uh, just, I mean, this is this, right? So this is the distribution. And uh, 
Now, what I want to ask, uh, it is changed. Right? So my row is whatever it is. And this would be something which is different from both this and this. right? You can also uh, substitute y as a uh, z square root of 2 minus x and wipe this out. So it's rho of x, rho of y of z square root of 2 minus x. Uh, and this is convolution. This is convolution integral. But generally, it's, it, it changes it a lot. So I would like to know where I would eventually come after many, many steps, which means that I would like to uh, uh, consider a fixed point of such transformation. What does it mean, a fixed point? It means that I want this to be the same as this. It's just the same distribution. So I'm <laughs> saying is that now I want uh, uh, how I would write it. So uh, I would say that this would be uh, y, and this would be, yes, uh, let me call it x dy rho y, and this would be x minus y. So this is the equation. So now it is the same distribution. It's a nonlinear integral equation imposed on rho. How one solves it? Yes? Fourier transform. Because it's a convolution integral, I can diagonalize convolution integral uh, making Fourier transform. Namely, I would consider that uh, I would introduce rho of k, which is an integral rho of x, exponent i k x dx, right? Uh, this is my transformation. And now what I will do, I would multiply this equation i k x square root of 2, uh, integrated extra over dx. I could multiply this a, a k x square root of 2 integrated over dx, right? So now, <coughs> and, uh, and then I would can also uh, write this uh, minus a k i plus i k i, so that this with this would give me uh, rho of uh, k. And so I would get uh, the right hand side would be rho squared of k because you see I integrate over x and over y with the same k, right? So this, this argument, and this does not matter that it's shifted. And, but here I take rho over x and multiply it by k square root of 2. So what I will get out of it is uh, rho k square root of 2. Look if it's, if it's visible, OK? So what's the solution of this? It's now algebraic, fortunately. So what I say is that taking a square is like multiplying my k by square root of 2. So what must be a solution? Some power of k squared. Power of k squared. You see, it's, it must have the same form. So this is kind of some function, yeah? Uh, and, but you take this and you multiply it on yourself, right? And so you get, it's, you wanted to, so you take function, multiply it by yourself, and it's the same function, but just with an argument shifted. What function is you, if you multiply it, it's not only power, it's also, also exponential. Yes, what? Uh, some exponential k squared. Yeah, it must be exponential. Uh, and let's see if I take k squared, right, and multiply it by exponential 
of k squared, then I will get exponential of minus 2 k squared, which is the same as exponential minus square root of 2 k squared. Right? So it's Gaussian, non surprisingly. And if I now Fourier transform it uh, back to uh, uh, rho of x, so rho of x, of course, the uh, Fourier transform of Gaussian is also Gaussian, right? So it would be exponent minus x squared. Well, we knew this. This is a uh, elegant physicist way to prove central limit theorem, right? Because essentially what we are doing, we're adding random numbers, and we're saying that if you do it long enough, you would get into a fixed point of this procedure, which is a Gaussian distribution, right? That's kind of, did we prove it, by the way? what really we need to turn it into a mathematical proof. We need stability. We have shown that this distribution is a fixed point of this procedure, right? But we did not show that this procedure would really would go to it. So that if we'll take a distribution which is a close enough to it, it would really evolve towards this distribution upon this transformation, right? So we have this transformation. Rho prime of z is equal to rho of x, rho of y, delta function x plus y minus square root of 2z dx dy. Generally, it's, it's a new distribution, right? So if I take a distribution which is not exactly equal to this, a little bit different, this is what is called stability analysis. I need to make sure that the change would be towards this and not away from it. Because a fixed point, as we learn from organization group, and this is one of the main objects there, could be stable and it could be unstable. So really, it's not that we are, uh, it is that simple that we can, we now really need to prove that this is a stable fixed point. And <coughs> uh, let me get a new chalk. Good. Uh, so how we do it? We say that now rho is, let's call it rho naught. This is my fixed point. And so I call it rho naught plus h. Yeah. Rho naught 1 plus h. And um, so now what I need to take uh, here, I need to uh, plug here rho naught plus h, rho naught plus h, which would turn into the h prime of k, and I'll be working with, with this, right? So <coughs> would be uh, k square root of 2. This is my this side. And from here, I get uh, uh, twice h of k, right? So this is what I got out of, uh, yeah. this is my uh, linearized equation of renormalization transformation, okay? Good, or oh, I can, yeah. Uh, so now we need to ask what are eigenfunction of this equation. So what is h of k, let's say number m, there will be a set, infinite set of eigen uh, uh, modes, uh, and what are the eigen modes of this um, equation? So I take, uh, which means that eigen mode, which means h prime will be equal to h of k. So 
So this is H M Yes. Uh, it's actually uh, any power uh, of it. So if I take just k in the power m, then and I plug it here. Well, sorry, I uh, I wrote it in correctly. It's it's a, with eigenvalue one. This is a solution. But generally, I need to say that h k of k square root of maybe it's better to write it like this. Okay. So this is my transformation, OK? And I'm saying that if I plug here some HM, it must give me uh, lambda M touch some tai HM, OK? So now if I take K in the power M, then I may have, I need to take lambda M, which is 2 in the power M. If I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, ah, no, 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 no. It's two, yeah, let's say from here. So H is, uh, let's apply this transformation, is two uh, K over two in the power M. So I take H equal to H M, which is K M, okay? And uh, so that's what I will get. Uh, and this I would write as 2 in the power of 1 minus m over 2 k to the m. Okay? So I took this form, plug it here, it gave me this. And now I'm claiming that this is what is the result of this transformation, which means that my lambda eigenvalue is 1 minus m over 2, okay? So this is a, a eigenmodes, and this is eigenvalues of this transformation, okay? Visible. It is, because uh, just, I, I put it uh, a square root of 2. Okay. Uh, Yeah, okay, now it's, uh, okay, uh, and here's the trouble, right? Because what we need for stability, what we want eigenvalues to be for the stability of our uh, transformation. We took a perturbation, we do this thing, it does this, right? So the new h prime is my old h prime times 2 and taken at k divided by square root of 2, okay? Let me just write it more clearly, okay? Now I see that there is, uh, generally I, I take arbitrary h, arbitrary perturbation, but I can expand it into this uh, uh, eigenmodes, right? And I see now that what I need, I need that for stability that lambda m's are larger than unity or smaller than unity. Stability, what requires? I want it to flow towards rho naught, which means that h must decrease. That's stability. For h to decrease, my eigenvalues must be less than unity. So that means over and over doing this uh, uh, transformation would decrease at every step, would be multiplied by lambda, by lambda must be less than unity, then many, many steps would bring h to zero. But it's not. It depends on m. And so if m is larger than 2, then lambda m is uh, 
smaller than 1. But what about m equal to 1? It's an unstable mode, if you wish, all right? And also for m equal to 0, all right? If m equal to 0, namely, I just take a constant uh, 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 modification. So what is, uh, is it really unstable? Did we prove that central limit theorem is wrong, that actually by summing random numbers, we do not come eventually to Gaussian distribution? Well, there is something missing here, and it's still stable. It's a very simple and yet very instructive example of stability theory. And I did part of my PhD doing stability. And it's a typical thing which you just, yes. m equal to 0, uh, which means it's shift by a constant, means changing normalization. That we cannot afford, right? So m equal to 0 forbidden by normalization. So normalization is a very important condition. And it really throws away this mode. One unstable mode is gone. Then you, you're ready to continue, yes? So you're saying that m equals 1 can be the, the assertion that our linear mode is just mean? Yes. m equal to 1 is something which is h proportional to k, right? Or if I transfer it into a, a x representation, it's kind of a gradient, OK? This is something which is a mean. And this mean value we assumed, we just work in such a way so that it is uh, equal to 0 and it does not change under this, uh, which means that, again, in our stability theory, among our perturbation cannot uh, happen such things which are corresponding to this value. You see, so when you do stability theory, it's always, <coughs> um, uh, but now the question is m equal to 2. Can we afford such perturbation or we cannot afford perturbation with m equal to 2? It's what is called marginal perturbation, namely that if I put m equal to 2, this is exactly unity, which means that it's a neutral. It's like this perturbation, it would, not decay. So it can, but I would stay, it's still a linear theory, right? But with a linear theory, at least it would mean that I would have something not growing as I go towards my perturbation, but not decreasing. But what actually kills this perturbation? We're talking conservation laws. It's, it's very similar to a to a, a usual representation group, just everything is visible. That what I like about this example. It lets you see all the bells and whistles of, of RG on a really simple setting. So those are conservation laws. One conservation law is normalization of our RG. Second conservation law is zero mean. We, wanna, we keep zero mean. And it means that among our perturbation would never appear perturbation with m equal to 1 and m equal to 2. What conservation law, conservation law of RG flow, what forbids this perturbation? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Of course, you're right. Variance. Because we keep variance, and n, n equal to 2 is exactly the change of variance. The perturbation with n equal to 2 would change variance of our distribution. It is not allowed. It's precisely for this reason we took the square root of 2. So m equal to 2, forbid, uh, it's a conservation of variance. 
And this is a very, very uh, uh, kind of clear and, and simple example which shows you that generally when you do transformation, even that simple, it always has a dangerous and unstable modes, right? And it is the physics of the problem. This is your choice of what actually this transformation need to preserve. And this conservation law restrict your possible perturbation or possible classes of, uh, of probability distribution which, which could evolve. So no matter where you start, your flow is such that it does not change these three quantities, right? So uh, it's always that you have rho dx equal to unity, x rho dx equal to zero, x squared rho x dx equal to unity. That's a conservation law, right? This rho now depends on the flow of renormalization group, right? You can put it n like, like you, you did n steps. But at every step, this three conservation law must be true, and that's what makes it stable, and that's what makes it central limit theorem. And it is this term which always mathematicians put over here. They say that this is a stable distribution because it's not enough to find fixed point. And as we learn from Ising models, that really you can have an unstable fixed point and stable fixed points. So they are very, very different. Okay. Now, what would happen if we do just probably last thing that we'll do today? Here is my razor. Okay. Uh, now, if we just uh, instead of this, take just half sum. Which means that now I want to preserve the mean, whatever it is. See, I'm just making a small change. Of course, if I would be a mathematician, I would write here 2 in the power mu and do you a general theory of mu distributions, etc. But uh, I myself prefer inductive things, which means show me one example, show me second example. Then I more or less know what would be in a general case. So if now we do this, then it will be something like this, right? And uh, uh, then my equation uh, over here would be what? Would be 2k, right? So this would be the only difference uh, that rho squared of k is rho of 2k. Now, what is the solution of this equation? One should not be that very different. So now again, I just take one times another, and it's the same as just taking k twice. So what's the solution? This is simple. Huh? Yes, of course it's exponential. Let's check. Exponent of my of k, it must be, you know, modulus, right? Because uh, squared means like this is exactly taken of 2k, right? So if you just take it squared, it's the same. So it's 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 exponential. Rho of k is exponent minus k even without the normalization factor. And what's its Fourier transform of exponential? It's something which has a, a, a simple pole in, 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 in one. So you don't remember Fourier. Uh, it's Lorentzian. Fourier transform is, well, if you take
you integrate from zero to infinity uh, uh, from uh, k positive, then you integrate over k negative, then you get sum, and then you get it's called Lorentzian. Uh, you're supposed to, otherwise you can say that if I take this and make a Fourier transform it, it has one pole in uh, x equal to i and another is equal to minus i. So when my k is positive, I close my contour over there. When my k is negative, I close my contour over there. That would give you exponent minus k for positive k and exponent plus k for, for negative k, which is exponent minus modulus k. Uh, do it, uh, I mean, at least once in your life, you need to do this simple computation. It's called uh, Cauchy distribution, if I'm not. Uh, uh, what is remarkable about this distribution? First of all, it's also a uh, fixed point, right? So this distribution is a fixed point of that procedure, but it's very, very different. Uh, By the way, I'm not doing it, but you're welcome to study stability for it. Uh, but what about uh, uh, variance of this distribution? Huh? It's infinite. Yeah, it's undefined. Which means that if you do this thing, right, you actually increase your variance at every step. And if you do this, then you your fixed point is if you just take x dx x squared plus 1, it diverges, right, at infinity, OK? Uh, so this is a distribution of the infinite variance. It's surprisingly what's widespread in physics. It's, it, it, it happened pretty often, this Lorentzian distribution for kind of many situations. but. You see how big difference change, uh, just a small change of a factor over here. And of course, mathematically, you can put here 2 in the power mu, and there is a beautiful classification of all, of, of all this stuff. Anyway, before we move forward, is, uh, uh, let's kind of look at it and uh, discuss the lesson. So uh, this is a procedure in which we uh, wipe out information, right? So we took in n variables, and we had a distribution for these n variables. And then we just, uh, every time we know these two numbers, we uh, replaced it by knowing its sum, which is, of course, much less information than knowing these numbers separately, right? And what we see is that. Uh, doing that procedure leads us invariably for uh, some limiting fixed point distribution. But what is crucial in determining what kind of distribution we obtain is to set a conservation law, right? Because in the Gaussian case, which we worked here, we did not only set the conservation law of variance. We also set the conservation law of momentum. And of course, we always set the conservation law of normalization, right? So this is, and that's why central limit theorem is such a powerful. This is a really, it's the simplest possible RG transformation having three integrals of motion. The moment we did just two integrals of motion, it's already totally different distribution, right? The fact that we do not fix variance immediately means that variance is indetermined and our fixed point is, is like this. Okay, and of course, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll just uh, start and then we'll continue. Then you can do the same thing with the, uh, uh, whatever physical variables you work with. And in particular, do I still have my sigmas over? Yeah, I have my sigmas over there. So uh, you can do it. Uh, with the uh, Ising model, which probably the way that many people actually uh, learned it. And this is done by the so-called, so again, when you have your sigma i, 
and some sigma i plus 1. In the standard Ising case, you consider, a, for example, a chain and those g i j was actually delta function of i minus j minus 1. So only nearest neighbors interacted. And in this case, it just was natural to take, let's say, two spins and consider their uh, half sum, or take three spins and consider a block, which would be a new sigma prime made out of this. So one way is that's probably what I would probably want to know, but I would start next time because I don't want to interrupt it. So you can, again, like you replaced over there, you can do uh, a new block spins, then consider interaction of them, and then ask how such distribution would essentially change. So now in this case, you know from which distribution you start. You start from Gibbs distribution written for the Ising model. And what we would do, we would try to see how this kind of changes uh, and look at it from the perspective of information theory. OK, I think it's enough for today. Any questions? How homework is, if somebody is doing homework, it's OK? OK, good. I think we'll start to get more or less three, four problems from now on. OK, okay good. See you next week then. And we'll have a, a, a break in the middle of November. There will be no lecture on November 11. But otherwise, OK. Good.